Hello everyone. Welcome to the 10th in our series of marine tech webinars. My name is Chelsea. I work on the Oceanscape project for Plymouth City Council and I'll be your host for this event. During this webinar, you will only hear myself and our presenters speak. You will not be able to see or hear any delegates. After the presentation, we will be holding a Q&A session. Please use the Q&A chat bar to ask any questions throughout the presentation. If you see any questions you would also be interested in hearing the answer to, give it a like and this will send it to the top of the pile. This webinar is being recorded with the intention to be available to others on demand. Enjoy and I will now hand you over to Kevin Forshaw. Thank you very much for that, Chelsea. Chelsea, my slides aren't moving forward. Can you see any change? Ah, oh, there we are. Got it now. Hang on. No, sorry, Chelsea, you're going to have to give me a couple of seconds. I've got the wrong slide deck up. Hold on a second. No worries. The people are still sort of filtering in, so no rush. Give me a bit of time then. Let's try this one. Right. Hopefully this is the right one. OK, so Chelsea, am I ready to go? Yep, ready to go. OK, thank you for that. Right, so today we're going to talk about Maritime UK in the southwest and essentially in this region we have three centres of marine and maritime excellence, those being autonomy, offshore renewable energy and aquaculture. Now I'm here today to talk about autonomy. Unfortunately, me and my colleague, my Plymouth colleague James Fishwick can't be here, so I'm going to be covering his slides as well. But I'm also very pleased to have Simon Cheeseman here today from the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Simon will be covering offshore renewable energy later. And also a colleague from Dors Dorset, Martin Sutcliffe, who will be talking to aquaculture. But before we start, I just want to uh, go through a quick video which will bring all of these three spheres together. Maritime UK Southwest plays a critical role in the UK maritime economy, contributing 3.8 billion gross value added via world class ocean science and technology, and a well established cluster which is focused on driving economic growth through innovation. The Southwest of the UK has ocean science and discovery in its DNA and is currently at the heart of an ocean technology revolution. The OECD predict that the global ocean economy will double in size by 2030, reaching a gross value added of around 3 trillion US dollars. Maritime UK Southwest is well placed to exploit this growth, driving economic opportunities whilst also addressing the global challenges of maintaining a healthy ocean and climate. Maritime UK Southwest drives growth in the ocean economy through innovation and collaboration, connecting businesses to the support they need, coordinating strategic regional development and through investment support. Maritime UK Southwest brings together excellent businesses, linking them with the world-class facilities in our research base. It also brings together a committed public sector. The Southwest has globally recognised strengths in autonomy and geospatial data, offshore renewables and ocean technology and aquaculture underpinned by one of the most developed advanced marine manufacturing clusters in the UK, which is accounting for one in five UK jobs in the sector. It is predicted that marine autonomy will grow into a global market of $136 billion over the next 15 years, with the UK taking a 10% market share. 
The Southwest is home to a critical mass of the UK autonomy supply chain and expertise in geospatial and environmental data. With an excellent range of trial and validation assets and cutting edge research organisations providing innovation support. The cluster boasts over 30 leading organisations delivering advanced autonomy solutions, including platform manufacturer, advanced sensor systems, communications, power solutions, system integrators and autonomy application specialists. The Southwest already attracts organisations from across the world to trial and develop advanced technologies. The Smart Sound Plymouth and the Portland Ranges in Weymouth Bay offer a diverse range of in-sea, real-world proving grounds, supporting advanced autonomy in both surface and subsurface platforms. These heavily instrumented ranges are backed up by world-class innovation support from Plymouth Marine Laboratory, Plymouth and Exeter Universities and the Marine Biological Association. Smart Sound Plymouth has recently benefited from over three million pounds of investment in state-of-the-art test platforms, including moored buoys and unmanned surface vessels. The investment has also delivered a high-speed advanced communications network across the Smart Sound which includes a 5G marine test bed. Our combination of test facilities, R&D support, skills and commercial capability make us the best place to invest and develop marine autonomy. The scale of the opportunity is potentially huge. The offshore wind market, it's growing extremely quickly. Floating offshore wind at the moment is a very small percentage of that market. So we'd like to think that in the not too distant future, we're going to be able to gain world leadership in this sector. That's what we're after. The last two years, we're just seeing a massive acceleration. So it's extremely exciting. What does this look like? Imagine a structure, a floating structure, which is 10,000 tonnes underwater and the size of the Eiffel Tower above water. And it gives you a sense of what we're thinking about. Imagine taking that one uh, device with a 10,000 tonne substructure, an above water structure of the size of the Eiffel Tower, and three kilometres of cables, and multiplying that up by 50. So we're talking about a very, very big industrialisation, something that hasn't been done before. The scale of the opportunity is, uh, as you've probably gathered, huge, and it has the possibility of transforming industry and uh, local economies in this region, which means, in simple terms, somewhere between 30 and 50 devices of the type that I've described. What does the investment climate look like? These projects will be long-term projects with 25 year plus horizons and, and very investable. With the increase in global population, there's more and more of a need for sustainable protein and aquaculture is a good way to do that, but there is room for expansion particularly in the Southwest. The Southwest has really good water quality for sustainable growth of bivalve shellfish and for sustainable growth of seaweed. And there's also an opportunity to expand onshore recirculation aquaculture to provide that protein. The Southwest is a really good place to invest with regards to aquaculture. It has good quality water close to inshore and further offshore, and also has access to good ports for work boat access for aquaculture installations. Global production of farm seafood has increased 5.8% year on year between 2006 and 2014. And sustainable aquaculture is predicted to supply over 60% of global protein from seafood by 2030. In 2012, the UK sector was worth over half a billion pounds and the UK was the primary producer of farm seafood by value in the EU. Growth of the UK sector is predicted to continue over the next five years to reach a total of 943 million pounds by the year of 2025. Southwest aquaculture already attracts international investment from some of the largest aquaculture companies in the world. The region is home to the largest offshore mussel farm in Europe and the largest producer of Pacific oysters in England. A diverse sector which includes finfish production in tanks and cultivation of seaweeds is supported by a world-class research and development sector from government departments such as the Centre for Fisheries and Aquaculture Science in Weymouth and world-leading academic research from the Universities of Plymouth and Exeter and the Plymouth Marine Laboratory. Higher and further education institutes offer training and career development in sustainable aquaculture and complementary subjects to provide companies with the workforce of the future. The recent award from the Department of International Trade of a high potential opportunity for sustainable aquaculture in Dorset 
has provided governmental support for development of the sector and is attracting significant interest in developing large recirculation fintech systems in the southwest. Investment from the Dorset and East Devon Thrifties Local Action Group has further grown the sector in the southwest and an additional 4.3 million investment from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport will see the development of an agri-tech focused 5G testbed providing aquaculture farmers with access to cutting edge, real-time, in-situ water quality monitoring. Aquaculture links extremely well with both offshore renewable energy through co-location initiatives and marine autonomy through work both on farm infrastructure technologies. This unique mix of good quality inshore waters, world-leading research and support from complementary marine sectors provides investors with a wide range of skills to develop collaborative projects. Maritime UK Southwest, a world leading ocean technology cluster. Find us on the web and contact us to invest or collaborate. So hopefully that gives you a flavour of what's going on there. I'm just going to leave those contact details there for a second, uh, but Chelsea's told me that all these slides and presentations will be available on YouTube afterwards. So if any of that has inspired you, please do get in contact. Um, now, firstly, I'd like to just provide a little bit more detail on the applied autonomy and geospatial data aspects. Um, my colleague, James Fishwick, cannot be here today. He's from Plymouth Marine Laboratories. Um, He's actually currently installing a new buoy, which I will come back to a bit later on. So I'm going to cover my slides. I'm also going to try to cover James's slides. So you might have to bear with me as I, I stumble through those. But just starting with what is marine autonomy, this is quite a sort of high level canter through. But really, we're currently focused here on the smaller marine autonomous platforms. These are small marine autonomous platforms for collecting data collecting data for scientific purposes or any sort of offshore operational purposes. But also longer term, we're going to have a focus on the future of autonomous shipping. There's various estimates as to when this will arrive. It'll probably be like automotive. It'll be a progressive uh, degree of autonomy in shipping. But there are several autonomous, fully autonomous vessels already operating, Yara Birkeland being a classic example. But within 10 to 30 years, we will see a future of autonomous shipping. And our interest in autonomous shipping will be about how these ships will engage with smart ports. So how do we engage all the embrace all the advantages of digital smart ports whilst making sure these are secure? Why is that going to happen in Plymouth? Well, we have the smart sound. I'll be coming back to that later, but we're also going to get 5G connectivity over the smart sound. And the university here, University of Plymouth, is very much leading in terms of maritime cyber security thinking. But coming back to those uh, smaller data collection vessels, so we have both surface vessels. Um, they're known by a variety of different terms, so unmanned surface, surface vessels, now they're being called uncrewed surface vessels as well. And the underwater ones, we have autonomous underwater vehicles and remotely operated vehicles. And often Am I back in the room? You are, yes. Sorry, I've got issues with rural broadband, which is one of the joys of these remote combinations. So marine autonomous systems, a smaller one, these capitalise on the safety um, and cost advantages of not having humans in the loop for data collection for the expanding ocean economy. Sorry, now I'm struggling to move my slides forward. So why is marine autonomy so important now? Well, the OECD have predicted that the global ocean economy will double to over three trillion US dollars by 2030. So this is a massive expansion. And this is interesting because we've got a rapidly growing global population. 
the land cannot sustain this growing population. So we're now looking to the ocean for food resources, energy resources and even mineral resources. But the uncomfortable truth here is, of course, um, the critical sort of critical to depend that healthy and productive ocean. Half the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean and the ocean is also a, a key buffer for absorbing a lot of the atmospheric CO2. So it's critical at the same time we increase the exploitation of an environment, we, we maintain uh, the environmental sort of health of that, that environment too. Seabed mining, this for example could be worth 40 billion to the UK over the next 30 years. We need rare earths for many applications, not just mobile phones, but also wind turbine, uh, wind turbine motors as well. So rare earths are required right across the board. Uh, difficult to get these terrestrially now, so we are starting to look at seabed mining. Aquaculture, uh, by 2030, the industry is projected to provide over 60% of the fish destined for human consumption. Um, and floating wind, there are various estimates, and I will defer to Simon Cheeseman later who will give you the more accurate estimates, but we are talking about four gigawatts installed by 2030, potentially 75 gigawatts by, by 2050. So ocean health is critical, and if growth is going to be sustainable, then obviously impact has to be measured. So for many regulatory planning and operational efficiency applications, data collection via marine autonomy is the way to go. And this is why marine autonomy has an estimated global market of 136 billion over the next 15 years, so a rapidly growing sector. Coming back to some of those uh, applications in a little bit more detail. So floating wind, for example, there is a whole raft of bathymetric water column, met ocean and environmental data collection required. This for site selection, but also ongoing maintenance. And current data acquisition costs by, by ship-based survey uh, can be as high as 15 million per gigawatt installed. Um, aquaculture here, we're talking about water quality monitoring, um, both to measure the impact from aquaculture operations on the wider natural environment, but also the impact to operations from things such as terrestrial runoff um, and harmful algal blooms, which can contaminate shellfish and make them unfit for human consumption. Marine autonomy largely came out of the defence sector, so, so here it is used for applications including mine countermeasures and anti-submarine warfare. But if we look at oil and gas and telecoms, this is really where you can get into great cost efficiencies for pipeline inspection or submarine cable inspection. And as I flagged earlier, deep sea mining, this is on the verge of being economically viable. And if you're dropping down uh, equipment to harvest resources at about four kilometres beneath the seabed, you need to have very accurate positioning, but you also need to be assured that you're dropping the equipment right onto sources where those concentration of minerals is sufficiently high enough. So the cost and safety advantages of data acquisition via marine autonomy are key to inform a lot of the information required for offshore operations. These are James's slides that I will try to cover, but um, in terms of a cluster here, it's very much triple helix. And when we talk about triple helix, we're talking about industry working together with academia and research. So often, in many cases, exploiting the research outputs from academia and taking those research outputs to market. But of course, that also has to be supported by government, local government, national government. And here it's around investment in infrastructure, investment in grant funding to cover that R&D to make all of this flourish. So as you can see here, there's a, there's a wealth of industry uh, players at the bottom there. Um, and the universities in the locality are Plymouth, Exeter, Plymouth Marine Labs, the Marine Biological Association and City College in Plymouth. We have um, a wealth of facilities uh, within the southwest to trial, demonstrate and validate applications of marine autonomy and sensor developments for various applications. Um, we have over a thousand kilometres of authorised and de-conflicted water space, very diverse trials environments with water depths of up to 80 metres. Um, these very much being heavily instrumented, um, and actually are the most intensively studied and understood bodies of water globally. Um, 
some of the images uh, at the bottom will give you an idea of the range of bathymetry we have there to collect data from those. And um, particularly, I want to talk about smart sound in a minute, but there's also a very extensive range, test range at Portland in Dorset as well. So really, the Southwest uh, really is the place to come and test and trial new autonomous systems for specific applications. So I'm struggling again with moving the slides forward. And it's recognition of these strengths in the Southwest uh, that's led us to being awarded a high potential opportunity by the Department of International Trade. This will put a team of experts working with us um, to develop a range of materials, both slides and also hard copy, to really promote the region's strengths to the global market that exists for marine autonomous applications. So coming back to smart sound in a little bit more detail, um, we have a lot of equipment here to support trials. Um, this equipment, including research vessels, which have high-end capabilities with underwater sampling systems, also ROVs and scientific rosette systems. The new L4 buoy, which is where James is today, currently installing this buoy, is a new major investment and not only a state-of-the-art scientific platform, but also a platform of opportunity for new sensor and technology development. The university has what we call USV CETUS. This is um, an L3 Harris Seaworker um, 4. And we also have the Autonaut 5 meter um, state-of-the-art um, surface vessel. Um, so this is a major investment in some new scientific platforms but these platforms are also a platform of opportunity for the new sensor and technology developments. The Smart Sound Connect project will see a 5G private network being installed across the port of Plymouth, and this will extend a mile or so offshore. And this will be available to users to develop all kinds of marine technologies and use cases. And the project will also deliver an IP NESH network across the Smart Sound geography for over 20 miles offshore. This again available to third parties for marine technology development. So do get in touch as these systems will also provide high speed connectivity for the, with the other smart sound assets. And finally, we have aspirations around our digital twins, digital twins being developed uh, as a virtual representation of the real world. And this of the real world of smart sound to drive technical developments in autonomy, smart ports, and port management as we go forward. So an awful lot going on in the marine autonomy space and the Southwest really being the ideal location for the development of marine autonomous systems for a variety of end user cases in the future. So please do get in touch on these aspects. There are contact details there. And as I said, I believe these slides are all going on YouTube afterwards so you can follow up then. I'd now like to hand over to Simon Cheeseman um, who is going to cover the uh, offshore renewable energy bit and mindful of my bandwidth and broadband issues, Simon. Um, I hope I managed to drive the slides for you successfully, but here we go. I'll, I'll keep the pace nice and slow. Great. Right, thanks very much, Kevin, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so I'm Simon Cheeseman. I work for the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. Uh, the Catapult is a government funded research organisation and we look at all elements of uh, offshore renewables. So that's um, offshore wind, both fixed bottom at seabed and floating, and also wave and tidal energy, and also sort of energy storage. So Kevin's very kindly pushed us onto the next slide. That's fine, uh, which is the agenda. So I'm, I'm going to just sort of, sort of um, give you an, uh, an appraisal of what um, floating wind is all about and really what the regional benefits are uh, as you come southwest and what's really grabbed our attention at the moment. Um, if you remember back to the video, you would have seen Steve Jeremy talking about um, the orders of magnitude of um, floating offshore wind when it's deployed and, and some of the amounts of um, components involved. So it's a massive, massive opportunity for um, the supply chain. And I think if you think in terms of um, you know current agenda, if, if we put COVID to one side for a minute, but think in terms of sort of climate change and net zero targets, then um, 
really sort of you know offshore wind is really the thing that's going to help us achieve those net zero targets and becomes you know um, critically important um, in the future but we've got to invest in that today to be able to sort of um, cash in that insurance guarantee in the future so those, those are the issues that I'm going to um, sort of talk through the technology a little bit of the regional benefit the approach that we're taking to enable the, um, the supply chain to cut its teeth into getting into this and then the interesting slides perhaps for you and um, to keep you baited is the investment and collaboration opportunities that we've got um, down here. Uh, next slide please Kevin. So offshore wind. Um, fixed bottom offshore wind out in the North Sea. Um, we've been doing that for quite some time now. Um, and we've seen that um, we, we've started to get involved in some of the fabrication aspects. Um, we're starting to see um, increasing amount of use of robotics um, offshore and onshore, um, primarily because you know we don't want to send people offshore into an extremely hazardous environment. So um, lots of opportunities for autonomous systems to do sort of um, checks around uh, assets inspection, asset survey, and eventually I think they'll be part of the, the installation process as well. So all this is backed up by um, a firm government policy. Um, you may or may not be aware of the government's um, sector deal with the offshore wind sector. And um, what that was trying to do was to um, ensure that the UK actually had a significant um, part to play in developing future offshore wind. We sort of let the Danes and the Germans do it to us a little bit in the um, in the North Sea and we're sort of scrabbling around now to sort of pick up a, um, some of the supply chain work, uh, which is starting to prove quite lucrative for us, but it's a, you know, it's a bit of a catch up. Um, down here in the southwest where we've got opportunities with um, floating offshore wind, um, you know, we, we don't want to have that problem. I'm going to sack my secretary in a minute for making the slides jump around. <laughs> Don't touch any buttons until I tell you, Kevin. I'm leaving it. <laughs> so, so the message here is um, a very strong government commitment. Um, slight adjustment to the figures that Kevin quoted. Um, originally, our, our sort of UK um, um, demand targets were anticipated to be 30 gigawatts of energy required by 2030 and 50 gigawatts by 2050. And these were sort of rounded up numbers, so they were easy for the politicians to remember. So 30 by 30 and 50 by 50. Um, and then when Boris Johnson's government came into power in their manifesto, they said, ah, no, it's going to be 40 gigawatts by 2030. And you would have he heard that reinforced actually um, uh, last week, I think it was. Um, and then the um, Committee on Climate Change said, oh, you've got it all wrong. Actually, it's not 50 by 2050. We actually need 75 gigawatts by 2050. Um, and there isn't that capacity out in the North Sea to be able to do that. So we need um, floating offshore wind to be able to fill in those gaps um, along with other energy types like sort of solar and things like that and, and sort of nuclear backbone. Um, but the, the key thing is we've got more. The resource is actually huge, particularly for floating offshore wind and um, more is possible. Um, and the UK actually leads uh, the way in a lot of um, the activities, certainly the research activities um, behind um, some of the key uh, elements of, of flooding offshore wind. So we're working with the supply chain and we're trying to help create and retain that knowledge and expertise um, that's particularly attractive and helpful for coastal towns and cities where a lot of these um, systems are deployed from. So if you go up around the northeast, go to the Humber, you'll see these are being used now as forward operating bases for North Sea offshore wind. Um, and that proves highly lucrative for um, these coastal communities that perhaps have seen the decline in fishing, uh, certainly a decline in shipbuilding, um, and so need some of that critical investment that is now starting to, um, to, to become apparent. Next slide, please, Kevin. OK, so here's a little bit on the technology. So we're going to focus specifically on um, on floating wind. Um, floating wind is really designed for those sea areas where the water's um, deeper than sort of um, 50 metres. We can sort of it's economically viable to put um, uh, offshore wind turbines on monopiles, on jackets and put them in a water depth of anything up to about 50 metres. Thereafter, it's still possible to do, but it's but when you're talking about large arrays, it's not so economically viable. So we've got technology now and we're starting to see that deployed that can accommodate floating wind. 
So these are essentially um, stabilized platforms um, with very large um, offshore wind turbines um, on the top. If you see any of the onshore um, ones, these are reasonably small. What we're starting to see now is um, probably seven and a half megawatt turbines um, going offshore for fixed bottom. Um, our facilities at Catapult, we can test up to 15 megawatt um, turbines. Um, and on the drawing board, we've got designs for 20 megawatt turbines. So we think that the, um, or well, we're seeing that the, the, you know, the first floating turbines are, are probably going to be around the sort of 10 megawatt um, size, but very quickly go up to, to 15 megawatt. And there's di different um, types of construction there. There's the barge type, semi-submersible, uh, multi-spar, spar, and tension leg platform. Um, tension leg platform is, is really sort of um, quite futuristic at the moment, um, and we're not sort of focused on that so much. Um, spar designs, you'll see those up in Scotland with the high wind design, and that spar element below the water is probably 75 metres worth of, um, of steel um, below the water. Um, down here in the southwest, then um, we can probably accommodate sort of barge types easily and even the semi-submersible designs. Um, key advantages for floating offshore wind is that from a planning perspective, and that's really important, um, they're, they're far offshore um, and they tend to be um, out of sight. Um, so we don't get those sort of visual issues that perhaps we get with um, nearshore um, installations. And because these aren't um, designed specifically for any type of seabed, like a monopile design would be, um, you can actually get into some volume manufacture with these. Um, and so, um, you know, if, if they're sort of modular design, then um, organisations can start producing these relatively quickly and I feel much more comfortable in a sort of productionized volume manufacturer environment with these rather than lots of individual sort of one offs. Um, other key other key thing is that uh, the mooring types are fairly traditional cantilever um, sort of more catenary moorings rather. Um, and so once you've put down your your anchors, once you've put down the mooring chains and you've laid your sort of export cables, then these devices can be hooked up pretty quick. You turn them to site and um, connect them up to the chains, connect up the cable that's been there floating on the on the end of a, of a buoy and um, you know you, you you do your commissioning and then you switch on and that's the key thing is how quickly can you switch these things on because immediately you switch them on you're then offset offsetting um, you know um, greenhouse gas production from sort of fossil fuels um, so that's really important and I've mentioned about the benefit to sort of coastal communities. Uh, next slide please uh, Kevin. Okay so um, in terms of jobs the um, the key areas of interest and if you can just flick again there's a build on here Kevin yeah we produced a um, the catapult produced a report that's fine thanks um, back in um, 2018 that looked at the um, opportunities for floating offshore wind in the UK um, and, and bear in mind this is moving so quick this was only two years ago um, and we highlighted um, that the key areas were Scotland and one more press of the button please Kevin and also down in the southwest, and that was driven by resource, um, so wind resource. Um, the further offshore you go, the more consistent your wind resource is, um, and you've got the deeper water where you can exploit um, multiple platforms comfortably offshore. Um, so down in the southwest, where I'm based, and I, mean, I run the Catapults office down in Cornwall, um, we're focused on the, the Celtic Sea, which is that little bit of, well, actually that large bit of sea that's off the tip of Cornwall, and um, comes off the, um, the southern area of Wales and round Ireland. So we're actually working with um, both Wales and Ireland to look at how we achieve economies of scale by working together through uh, the deployment of um, offshore wind. So you may have noticed that recently um, Ireland's declared a sort of um, fixed bottom offshore wind campaign. Um, Wales very much, uh, Welsh government very much on the um, on the on the pathway for for both fixed and floating offshore wind and working with us um, to develop the Celtic Sea. Next slide, please, Kevin. So what we've got down here in the southwest, just thinking about that Celtic Sea area, is something what we call the stepping stones approach. So um, a lot of companies down here in the southwest have been supporting uh, offshore renewables. They've been supporting activities in the North Sea. They've been supporting activities for offshore wind, wave and tidal energy in actual fact across the world. So, you know, um, sizable export opportunities. 
But in terms of um, building out um, very large installations, so you know, um, you know, 20, 30, 40 platforms, um, and building up to sort of 500 megawatt arrays, that's quite a jump um, in um, sort of production capability. And you have to do things differently. You, you can't sort of build one offs and then build multiples in the same way. So you've got to take a very careful look at how these things are going to be operated and um, used to understand how you can do that. So we're very fortunate here in the Southwest that we've got a number of opportunities to do this gradually. And if you look at the little map on the right hand side of that slide, that shows you the, um, the Celtic Sea. And um, earlier this year, the, the catapult did some what we call constraint mapping of that Celtic Sea area. So we started to look at where the shipping lanes were, where the um, fishing areas were, where the subsea cables were, um, a myriad of different constraints and started to identify those sort of zones, those areas of the seabed where we felt that um, flooding offshore wind could be deployed. So that's the small numbers that, that you see in there in those different zones. And then we've got um, we've got the wave hub site just off the north coast of Cornwall that was originally a wave um, test site. Um, so that's got a grid connection. That's got a 32 megawatt subsea um, uh, socket, if you like, as a grid connection. Um, and it's it's just um, going through um, reconsenting uh, of its section 36 uh, uh, consent to enable it to actually um, deploy um, floating offshore wind turbines. So a relatively modest site. Uh, in some respects, but an opportunity for the local supply chain to start to cut its teeth on, um, you know, how do, how do we make these things? How do we deploy them? How do we look after them? Because as um, Steve Jeremy tried to explain or did explain in the video, um, these are quite large structures, you know, large floating structures that they are never going to be permanently still. There is always going to be some sort of roll with the swell of the waves, even on a fairly calm day. So we've got to look at how do we actually get people out there to maintain these things? How do we how do we cope with um, unplanned maintenance and things like that? You know, do we leave them out there, repair them offshore or do we tow them back um, inshore? Um, and then in terms of, um, you know, growing the number of sites, then we've got something called the Pembrokeshire Demonstration Zone, PDZ. Um, that's another wave um, development site that's going to be um, reconsented to be half wave, half um, floating offshore wind. Um, and then we've got uh, a developer um, who's already broken cover um, and um, uh, a joint venture between the French um, energy company Tatel and um, Irish energy developer Simply Blue Energy uh, has formed to, to produce a, a company called Blue Gem Wind and they're actually going to develop um, a site called Erebus. Erebus was the name of a ship that was built in Pembroke um, and they're going to develop that um, site and they've actually you know they've broken cover um, the markers in the sand um, they've actually got a, a website with a procurement portal um, so the supply chain could actually um, put its details down on that portal and um, and um, you know to start to, to, to work on the business and then we've got some other sites that we know are going to start to break cover soon so um, there's a couple of demonstration sites and we know the trajectory of travel for the 300 and 500 megawatt sites so what we've got is a stepping stones approach where we go from a relatively small site like wave hub with probably four eight megawatt turbines and we pro progressively go up in size of turbines plus number of platforms um, thereby enabling um, the supply chain to, to sort of cut its teeth um, the other factor is at the moment um, if you're generating energy then and you're new technology quite often you need um, some support from the government in terms of a generating subsidy. Um, that's not actually a, around at the moment for, for floating offshore wind. It's there for fixed wind, um, but um, the government have, have announced and had a, um, a review of the contracts for difference and are looking at creating or bringing in floating offshore wind into um, that uh, contracts for difference mechanism. Um, so that will really open the floodgates then to enable um, this to sort of take off. Next slide, please. So the catapult did a report in 2019 looking at the supply chain specifically down here in the southwest. Uh, so down here, sort of um, Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, um, Wales region as well. Um, see, these are some of the headline figures in terms of um, potential regional value by 2030, assuming that sort of stepping stones 
um, goes forward and and this is very conservative as well so um, I'll let you dwell on the details when you get the slides or, or whilst I'm talking but um, you know the, the job potential um, is huge um, we've already got um, you know a number of companies that are involved in these activities already but the size of the opportunity for the deployment of these things and remember I talked about the sort of volume manufacture um, the amount of sort of data analysis that needs to be collected in the planning stage, um, the amount of sort of project planning that needs to go on, and then the subsequent sort of operations and maintenance support is absolutely huge. Um, and there's more than enough work here for everyone. Um, the key thing is that we want to retain this work for the UK. We don't want to have other um, countries come along and sort of do this to us necessarily. We want to be in the driving seat um, for all this work. Um, the, the Catapults um, supply chain report is available from our website. If you get in touch, though, I, I, I can send you the link to that um, without any problem at all. And also the macroeconomic report that talks about the, um, the jobs opportunity is also the, um, the level of investment that the government would have to make in terms of the sort of contracts for difference. And then also the consent mapping um, report is also available. So there's three um, sort of um, pathway reports there that I can sort of supply to people just to say, you know, this sort of reinforces the, the, the point that this is happening. It's happening now, um, particularly with these companies that are sort of breaking cover and starting to work in these areas. And we're already seeing contracts go out for um, collecting bathymetry work, uh, bathymetry data in the Celtic Sea, looking at um, cable routes. Um, and next year we, we'd expect to see sort of floating LIDAR work um, where people are collecting the sort of um, the data. Um, the bankable data for, for offshore wind. Uh, next slide, please, Kim. So it, here's a bit more of a, a, a focus on um, the sort of investment and collaboration um, opportunities. Um, I talked about um, Blue Gem Wind. They're, they're developing the Erebus project. Their procurement portal is open. Um, you can get involved there. Um, down here in the southwest, we've launched the Celtic cluster. And really, that is a sort of focal point for the supply chain down here to start to speak with one voice and start to engage with developers and provide a route for developers as well to talk to the supply chain without having to ring up multiple different people um, to sort of talk about, um, you know, product development and um, sort of, um, you know, getting to grip with the activity down here. Um, so whilst that's being set up, the, the catapult as a sort of independent um, national organisation is acting as the uh, as the interim chair, um, but the real members um, within that are the Welsh Government, Marine Energy Wales, the Cornish, uh, Cornwall and Arms, the Silly Local Enterprise Partnership, and Wave Hub Limited um, uh, are all there as a, as the main board for the Celtic Cluster, and we're now inviting companies to sort of get involved and um, come speak to us. Um, the Catapult also runs something called the Floating Offshore Wind Centre of Excellence. And that engages with all the various clusters around the UK. So um, we're talking to all the, you know, both the ones in Scotland, both to the East Coast, down in the Solent, and also to here down the Southwest through the um, the Celtic cluster. So there's a lot of activity now um, starting to um, boil up, and um, a lot of work being done. Um, importantly, there's a, a, a consortium down here now that's being led by Cornwall and Arves, the Silly Lep, Wave Hub, and ourselves, and the Universities of Exeter and Plymouth. And AMP group, and we're pulling together a, um, a 74 million pound program to help accelerate flowing offshore wind down here in the southwest and create that critical mass of supply chain um, investment. And that's being done through what's called a Strength in Places Core, which is a UK research and innovation core um, that's there to exploit and accelerate sort of um, uh, research and help to leverage business growth down in the area. So um, that will come with um, a delegated grant scheme um, which would enable organisations to um, have some of their projects part funded down here and now allow organisations to sort of inwardly invest into Cornwall and um, Plymouth to um, be part of this, this, um, this strategic push. The Catapult run a number of initiatives um, which we'll be introducing into the southwest in 2021. These are all about um, helping industry to build up capability and prepare itself to be ready to bid into um, procurement calls for offshore wind. So make sure you're working to the right standards, you've got the right sort of um, uh, company processes in place to enable you to bid in. Um, key thing 
though, is that you know there is a need for more vessels. There just aren't enough um, probably ships almost in the world to do a lot of these things. Some of the heavy lift opportunities and needs and some of the um, offshore craneage needs uh, are, are, are massive. Um, and so, you know, there's a need for more manned and unmanned vessels down here, um, as well as sort of uh, installation support vessels and uh, anchor handlers and um, sort of floating cranes and um, float towels as well. So um, a big opportunity for the maritime sector. Um, and that's been encouraged by Bayes, who recently introduced or, or put out a call for proposals around in investment in port infrastructure. Um, interesting enough, they were talking in terms of ports that could cope with two to three gigawatts of of, um, uh, of offshore wind per year, which I think is a bit extreme. But uh, nonetheless, we're, we're obviously encouraged ports to, to respond to that and landowners to respond to that. Uh, next slide, please, Kevin. OK, um, drawing this to a close then. So um, offshore wind um, really is key at the moment. You know, think think about sort of climate change. Think about trying to achieve these net zero targets. A lot of organisations, a lot of councils are declaring these net zero targets, but not really sure how they're going to get there. With um, with floating offshore wind, you can do it and you can do it in spades. Um, a huge opportunity down here, down in the southwest with the Celtic Sea. It really is open for business and there's the investment backing it up as well. So we'd like to see companies sort of coming forward and say, I'd like to have a piece of that. I'd like to be interested in that. Um, as I say, a lot of the pre preliminary work's already started, so there's lots of evidence that it's actually happening. Um, and what we want is the southwest to be um, the, the leader in floating wind. Um, but this opportunity won't you know, last forever. You know, this window of opportunity will quickly close and others, you know, on the continent are, um, are looking over our shoulders with envy. Um, but the key thing is that there's so much to do. It, it's all about collaboration and partnership and, and that's the way to open up new possibilities. So thank you very much indeed for your time. Happy to take any questions. Probably they're, they're coming a different route, uh, but I'll leave that up to Kevin to, um, to sort of chair that. Um, if you want to get in contact direct, then please feel free. And I think the next slide has just got the normal uh, Maritime UK Southwest contact details. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you very Thank much. You very much um, um, sorry, I've got right. bandwidth is finished. I've also got a family issue. Um, <laughs> brilliant. brilliant. So, so we're going to take a few questions at the end. Um, um, I'd like to hand over to Martin Sutcliffe, who's going to take us through aquaculture. And Martin, if you want to say next slide, I will do my best, but my machine is jumping all over the place. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm Martin Sutcliffe. I um I actually work for Dorset Coast Forum, but one of my other hats is as chair of the uh, Southwest Aquaculture Network. Uh, I'm funded directly by the Marine Management Organisation. Uh, my my position is actually unique in England as an Aquaculture and Fisheries Development Officer for uh, for Dorset, but obviously I work all, across the wider Southwest. Next slide, please, Kevin. I thought it'd be um, useful to kind of set the scene a little bit initially, um, probably a diverse audience today, and just kind of talk around aquaculture initially, um, about what it is and, and how and how it can be sort of developed in the southwest. So aquaculture is the reading, the breeding, rearing and harvesting of fish, shellfish, plants al and algae um, and any other organism really in, a, in a, an aquatic environment. Um, I'll focus today mainly on the marine environment for obvious reasons, um, but it is worth noticing, uh, noting rather the across the southwest there is a, a thriving freshwater um, aquaculture sector which focuses mainly on finfish, um, namely trout, uh, some arctic shark production as well, uh, and then what, there's a strong watercress sector as well. Um, so currently there are lots of different species across the southwest, um, finfish, um, shellfish, um, seaweed, the shellfish are mainly a filter feeding, so that'll be uh, Pacific oysters, scallops, clams, mussels, etc. Um, and then aquatic plants such as seaweeds, as I say, uh, which is an emerging sector. Uh, I'll come to that a little bit later. And then the freshwater um, ex examples of aquatic plants such as watercress. So the um, finfish are mainly cultivated uh, for, fre for the saltwater sector in recirculating aquaculture sy systems on shore. Um, so there's no actual in situ as such um, finfish cages around the southwest. Um, and typically aquaculture is kind of categorized into four different areas of offshore. So generally outside of the six mile nautical limit or very close to. 
um, or maybe inside just around the three nautical miles limit inshore and sheltered bays and in lee of islands and that sort of area and harbors and estuaries intertidal fairly self-explanatory um, usually on trestle tables um, you can see oysters there they, they're cultivated in the fleet lagoon for example intertidally uh, and then onshore as i mentioned in uh, recirculating aquaculture systems slide please kevin so why aquaculture um well we're probably all aware that wild, wild fisheries have plateaued at best um, and this coupled with the increase in global population and the increased demand for sustainable protein means that aquaculture is one of the most effective ways of being able to meet these needs. Um, Kevin touched on this a little earlier um, with the 30 percent, sorry, 60 percent of global protein from seafood will be provided by aquaculture by 2030. Uh, I was reading this morning, actually, a, a, a British Columbia University study um, has recognised that around about 72 million square kilometres of um, ocean is suitable for mariculture, which is the sort of the marine um, sister of aquaculture, if you like. And this all lies within companies, uh, oh, sorry, within countries EEZ. So there's a huge opportunity to, to expand it. Um, currently around the globe, around about 112 countries and territories produce seafood in the marine environment, the UK obviously being one of those. Um, and in, in 2013, the global mariculture sector um, was worth 65.4 billion US dollars. Um, and that's just focusing on the saltwater sector. There's still another 60 odd, 65 percent that was dedicated to the freshwater sector. This year really was a, a turning point for um, for aquaculture as the first time um, in history that aquaculture provided an equal amount of system, of um, seafood protein when compared to wild capture fisheries. So uh, it really is a fast growing global sector. Um, the UK market is expected to grow over the next five years, as I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, to 943 million pounds by 2025. Um, and carbon sequestration can't really be left out of the uh, left out of the equation. Seaweeds, for example, can sequester carbon um, as they grow, although with a caveat as to how they're actually used after they're grown. Uh, if you burn them, obviously that releases the carbon back into the atmosphere. And actually some um, some bivalve shellfish, for example, oysters, can also sequester carbon as they grow. So there's, there's an opportunity to use the, the, this type of aquaculture for uh, ecosystem services uh, on a wider scale. And then finally, um, short supply chains. Uh, we're all probably aware of the um, recent trend to move to shorter supply chains, mainly influenced by COVID-19. Um, but this has been particularly pertinent in the seafood sector. Um, a lot of people have moved towards local supplies for seafood and um, co-location and location of recirculating aquaculture systems on shore, for example, next to large conurbations can really aim to drive down supply chain distance and help also with the uh, the net carbon um, initiative from the UK government. Slide please, Kevin. Thank you. So aquaculture in the southwest, what have we got here? Well, we've actually got the largest mussel farm in Europe already uh, in the southwest in operating in Lime Bay. Um, when it's fully operational, they'll be, they'll be producing around about 10,000 tonnes per annum of uh, rope grown mussels. Um, we also have the largest producer of Pacific oysters in England, uh, just a bit further east in Pool Harbour. Uh, and we have quite an emerging south, uh, immediate emerging seaweed sector. The seaweed is probably the new wonder crop, as I alluded to a little earlier. Um, multitude of uses, anything from high grade pharmaceuticals down to just fertilizer and um, plowing it into fields to help with crop growth. Um, this at the moment is focused on Cornwall and Port, uh, Dorset in Portland. Um, but there is a, also an emerging sector and licenses going in for uh, development of seaweed in Devon. Uh, the recirculating aquaculture system um, is a really a new development. Um, this is the technology improvements over recent years have allowed this to happen. Um, the US, Norway, France and the Middle East now all produce large volumes of, of fin fish in recirculating aquaculture systems. Um, they have a couple of advantages. Obviously, you can control uh, the environment much more, more effectively. There's no issues with any sort of um, sea lice or any inf uh, disease outbreaks, um, and it's much more to control, much much easier to control uh, the environment, as I say, with regards to temperature and and feed and production. So that they're an exciting uh, development. Um, I see personally that 
as being a potentially key development uh, for the southwest with the co-location next to large conurbations of recirculating aquaculture systems. Slide please, Kevin. So aquaculture obviously needs uh, supporting industries um, and we have in, in Dorset, in, in Weymouth, actually the Center for Environment, Fisheries and Aquaculture Science. Um, but it's also, the region's also um, home to world-class marine um, academic research. The, the cluster there shows you um, all of the different kind of co, uh, complementary, I think, complementary um, industries that are around the Southwest. And you can see that the map's really well clustered um, around Cornwall, around Dorset and around both Devon, the north and the, and the south coast of Devon. Um, we've got also a, uh, a fantastic um, courses and um, training development uh, network set up here. Um, we've got Plymouth University, Exeter University, Bournemouth University, amongst others uh, that provide that that training and that, that workforce that I mentioned in the video. Um, and also we have the kind of the grassroots um, training, if you like, Kingston Moore College, for example, in Dorset, they, they've recently launched an aquaculture course, which is level two and level three. So kind of a level um, kind of pitch and that's been developed really closely with with the industry uh, in the southwest to ensure that actually the people the students that come out of that course are, are able to fit straight into the aquaculture sector straight away and then of course we have the Plymouth Marine Laboratory down in Plymouth uh, which which provides uh, again world-class world-class um, research across the marine sector we've also got quite a number of good ports dotted around the southwest, um, easy access for farm sites if you're going to be offshore, um, but then also complementary to that shipbuilding and maintenance for work vessels. Um, the next slide please come in. So announcement uh, to growth uh, in general across the southwest and Eng in England to be fair, uh, there is imminently going to be a national English aquaculture strategy which uh, is being worked upon by uh, projects being run by Seafish, the industry authority called Seafood 2040. Um, I've actually fed into that um, and the, one of the recommendations that's likely to come out of that is that regional aquaculture strategies are um, are adopted ar around the country. Um, we have one in Dorset, thankfully, uh, which has been developed over the last four years. In, again, close to consultation with, um, with the stakeholders here. Uh, and this is really the first time that a sector such as aquaculture has had that ability to have a, a, a one voice and a collective kind of um, direction for, for development of the strategy, uh, sorry, development of the sector. Um, we've also got co-location uh, with offshore renewables. Obviously, Simon talked at length with regards to offshore renewables. Um, the part, I think Denmark has released, uh, now have uh, a statutory requirement for any offshore renewable energy to have um, aquaculture considered alongside it. Uh, and some some sort of um, consideration like that in the UK uh, could well see aquaculture be located alongside uh, offshore wind turbines, for example, where you can grow strings of seaweed or strings of bivalve shellfish between between the turbines. And then um, 5G rural uh, 5G um, tech can also help produce uh, the the next level of aquaculture. Uh, we've got 5G rural Dorset, and obviously the the Plymouth Sound project that Kevin and Simon mentioned earlier. Um, and that, that just goes as well for the 5G tech for connectivity of the farms themselves, but also for autonomous work vessels and drone supports. Uh, south, a couple of companies in South America have developed drones that are able to detect photosynthetic rates, which means you don't need to send a work boat out to the seaweed farm to um, check whether the seaweed is still growing. You can fly a drone out, see if everything's growing. If it's not, then you know you've reached your maximum peak harvest and you can send your work guys out to, to collect the harvest and massively reduce overheads. Slide please, Kevin. So investments in collaborative, oh, back one, thank you. Investments in collaborative, off collaborative opportunities. Um, as I say, large scale ras production uh, for both finfish fin fish and shellfish in the Southwest. Uh, we've had a number of inquiries through the H for, for the HPO, um, for the high potential opportunity, sorry, uh, for sustainable aquaculture in Dorset um, for finfish production in the Southwest. As I said, the, uh, the advancements in technology and the ability to be able to grow salmon, for example, and other high value fin fish in tanks, uh, for example, yellowtail kingfish, really is the next big development, I, I believe, in, in aquaculture in the southwest and across Europe. Um, 
development of specialized work vessels, um, including maritime technology, hull, hull technology and specialist propulsion, um, working in and around offshore um, aquaculture installations can be quite hazardous. Obviously, you've got ropes in the water and pulling water ropes in and out of the water. Specialist propulsion could well actually help develop systems that uh, remove the risk of entanglement. Um, and then obviously with Simon talking about the offshore renewable energy and the floating offshore wind, um, the, uh, oh, we've gone back a couple of slides. Thank you. <laughs> That's all right. Um, mooring and anchoring systems, um, you know, anchoring systems that potentially reduce the uh, impact on the seabed when you're, when you're mooring lines uh, or anchoring systems that can make it easier to, uh, to work around the farm itself. And then 5G obviously comes into water quality monitoring, um, detecting those harmful algal blooms that Kevin mentioned and detecting those sewage runoffs. Um, one of the potential issues for bivalve shellfish, um, particularly bivalve shellfish that come into the human food chain um, is obviously harmful algal blooms and, um, and sewage runoff, which can render the, render the product uh, inedible, unfortunately. Um, and then further development of offshore shellfish and wind far uh, seaweed farms as well. Slide, please, Kevin. Thank you. And I think it's worth mentioning uh, the food standards testing for shellfish. Um, you may be aware that E. coli is used as a as a testing indicator for the suitability of waters around the south around the south coast or around the whole of the UK, actually, for cultivation of shellfish. There may be an opportunity to develop more robust tests. Um, using different species or better indicator species um, that that would provide the, the industry with with a more robust and a more clear uh, route of, of water quality. And then finally, training and career development we've already mentioned with regards to Kingston Moorwood and the, the excellent universities we have around the southwest. And one more slide, thank you, Karen. And so there's the Southwest Aquaculture Network. Um, we established this um, with the help of Maritime UK um, earlier, late last year. Uh, we now have an 80 plus membership, covers all sectors of the marine, of the marine environment, aquaculture, um, NGOs, offshore renewable energy, maritime and marine. Um, and the idea is it's to try and develop these oven ready collaborative projects. Holding, we're holding quarterly meetings at the moment. If anybody wants to come along, then please do um, get in touch with myself or Joe Rufus, who provides a secretariat um, for the for the chair for the Swan. Um, the next meeting is on the 21st of, of October. Um, we've got some really good um, talks at that meeting as well. Obviously, it's virtual at the moment, but hope, we hope to be able to get together in the real world in the next in the next little while. And I think that is me. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Thank you, Martin. So huge thanks to Martin, huge thanks to Simon. I, I think it's really great to hear about three mm. exciting growth areas, you know, areas creating new jobs, creating new wealth. Re really good to hear about those growth industries. Chelsea, I'm sorry we've overrun, but um, I'm going to bounce back to you to see if we've had any questions come in for those who can stay a bit longer. Yep, we have. Um, just a remind everyone that if you do have any questions, um, now's the time to ask them. Just type them in the live Q&A chat bar. Um, so first we have a nice comment from Joanna, just saying great film. Um, the first question is, um, they can see that offshore wind has huge potential and will utilise increasing areas. What is the opportunity for aquaculture industry to co-locate, especially in nearer shore areas? Yeah, good question. Um, I suppose floating offshore wind is going to be fairly far offshore um, and they're going to be fairly sizable platforms. Um, I'm not I'm not aware of any direct um, work between aquaculture and floating offshore wind at the moment, and maybe there's people who can put me right on that. Um, I, I, I wouldn't rule out in the future. I, I think the, the disciplines are, uh, are slightly different. Um, you know, with um, one, one of the things we're sort of concerned about is getting uh, technicians off to offshore platforms and making sure those platforms are accessible. Um, and, um, you know, we, we've got to make sure that the environment's safe for two different sectors to, to sort of collaborate in. Um, and I know there's a lot of work going on in Europe around that. So, uh, maybe we're sort of um, training a little bit in that sense. Okay, thank you, Simon. 
Uh, next, que next question is from Jane. I would be interested in finding out more about the Danish approach regarding co-location of aquaculture and offshore wind. Are there any other countries that you know of adopting a similar approach? Yeah, I think I think there are. I mean, I've, I've heard some reports about what's going on in Belgium. I, I believe there's quite a bit going on in Belgium. I think there's some stuff going on off the coast of Holland. And I think I think the issue in this country that, that's held it up is there seems to be a mismatch in the insurance regimes um, covering floating offshore wind and then separately aquaculture. But, you okay. know, my 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 only comment with this, if, if you're going to make that huge investment in installing any sort of in, infrastructure offshore, and if that infrastructure is then going to have 5G connectivity and people going in and out to it, taking out supplies, then obviously I would say that sort of co-location around multiple use platforms is, is, is the way forward. But Martin, I don't know if you've got any more thoughts being closer to aquaculture. Um, I think the, the thing you were mentioning in, in Belgium is an interreg project. Yeah, I um, and I think they're, they're looking at that exact thing of co-locating offshore turbines with with seaweed culture, I believe. Um, I think it comes down, you're absolutely right, Kevin, to that issue of insurance. You know, you, you're building multi-million pound turbines and you, you're going to put working vessels potentially from a different company around those turbines, which obviously adds huge complications and huge issues with regards to um, a different entity, if you like, being in and around quite close, obviously, to the turbines. Mm. I suppose the irony, irony is if we put anything in the water, you know, whether it's fixed bottom or floating, we actually create those um, that turbulence to actually encourage the growth of shellfish and fish stock. So uh, it, it's sort of something we well. ought to look at. <laughs> I would imagine as well, you probably get growth on the actual turbines of. Oh, uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. Muscles, yeah. So, yeah. 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 OK, thank you. All. Um, next question is for Martin. Are there any fin fish species naturally occurring in the southwest that are earmarked as novel candidate mariculture species? Um, there's nothing that I'm aware of at the moment. I did have a little sneaky peek at that question before before you asked me, Chelsea. Um, there's nothing that I'm aware of that's being earmarked at the moment, but whether there's potential for the likes of bream, black bream, for example, or something along those lines, kind of one of those species that we know the life cycle of. I know that cod have been tried in the past, um, but whether the southwest is suitable for the cod, I question due to increase in water temperature and climate change. Um, but perhaps there's more research to be done around those those endemic species that, that could well be the next big thing for aquaculture. And that doesn't necessarily need to be in the sea. That could well be on shore as well using pump, pump ashore sites. OK, thank you for that. Um, We've got one last comment from Joanna just saying the next one meeting is Tuesday the 20th of October, one till three. And that is all the questions that we have. Um, I will draw the webinar to a close. We've overrun slightly, but thank you for everyone for staying on. And a big thank you to all our presenters today. Um, has anyone else got any closing comments? Nothing for me. No, all good. Thank you, Chelsea. Thanks. Thanks for pulling this together. Thanks again to Simon and Martin. Very good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. OK, cheers. Okay. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.